We're excited to welcome uh, Dr. Katie Planey, uh, CEO of ACELOT. Uh, Dr. Planey will be telling us uh, about a novel oral small molecule uh, drug for the treatment of sporadic ALS. Uh, welcome, Dr. Planey. Thank you, thank you. Uh, um, I'll just cue it up, but yes, since I am the first one, I will make sure that we actually are uh, staying on time. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> so I do wanna thank you, first off, for the opportunity to speak today. We're really excited that we've been invited back for a second time to speak at the program. Um, and I also really want to thank the, the ALS patient community. Um, we certainly invite you to further discussions. Please use the ALS Zoom chat today for questions. Uh, we do have a WhatsApp channel for ACELOT if you're curious and want to ask further questions offline after the conference. So we'll have the QR code in a few places. You certainly can also just use email. We're, we're happy to answer any questions. So I'm Katie Planey. I'm CEO of ACELOT. Uh, I have been leading transformational startups um, in biotechnology um, throughout the start of my throughout my career. Uh, I also co-founded an exosome therapeutics company prior to ACELOT, and I also received an MBA and PhD in biomedical informatics. ACELOT's leadership team has decades of drug discovery experience. In addition to our stellar executive team, we do have an amazing in-house team here at J-Labs in South San Francisco. And so this in-house team is dedicated to delivering a therapy that is disease modifying uh, to people with ALS. And so I just really want to call out our amazing preclinical team and our computational discovery team, because a lot of data you'll see in these slides today uh, were produced by them. So ACELOT harnesses novel AI and machine learning methods across the entire drug discovery process. Our founder is Dr. Amur Singh. He's a University of California computer science professor. Uh, and I just want to call out specifically that we do indeed use computational methods to actually design our literal chemical structures. So the development candidate I'll be walking you through today was indeed discovered through computational methods. So in terms of our pipeline, um, we do have a platform. So we have several early stage exploratory programs also in neuro, but I'm gonna be focusing today on our TDP43 program. That's by far the most advanced, in particular our ACE2223 development program. In terms of salient timelines for, for patients on the call, uh, we're looking at starting our healthy human volunteer dosing at the end of next year, so at the end of 2025, and then we'd be looking at dosing in patients with ALS towards the end of 2026. So ACE2223 is a development candidate for non-genetically associated ALS, essentially sporadic ALS. It is a first-in-class orally bioavailable small molecule, so you take it as a pill once a day. Um, that targets disease-associated TDP43 aggregates. We're really excited that ACE2223 is first in class for a historically undruggable target. As many of you may know, TDP43 is a, a very tricky drug target. It has both a gain and loss of function. Additionally, the disease-associated form is an aggregate, so there is no crystal structure. That means you have to use novel methods to do any sort of structure activity design to find a compound. So I'm just gonna call out at a high level some of the unique characteristics of our development candidate ACE2223. So first off, this development candidate is specific and that it targets the disease associated hexamer. Hexamer just means a sixamer, i.e. six TDP43 proteins aggregated together. ACE2223 is also safe, meaning it doesn't disrupt normal protein function. It treats both the gain and loss of function of TDB43. It extends survival in an extremely aggressive ALS mouse model. And it also has restorative functions. For example, we see decreases in NFL over time. I'll walk you through data today showing all of this. I also want to note GMP manufacturing is well underway, and we are literally right in the middle of rat and dog dose range finding studies at Charles River. So we are moving as fast as we can to get this into the clinic. I want to take a little bit of a step back. I'm sure you know many people have discussed TB43 today. Many of you are familiar with the target, but I do want to put it in the context of ACE2223. So ACE2223 breaks up TDP43 aggregates and it restores cellular function. So in a normal healthy motor neuron state on the left-hand side, you see that TB43 sits predominantly in the nucleus. That allows it to engage in correct splicing of multiple RNAs. And that leads to functional proteins such as UNC13A and STMN2. In a disease state, you get that gain and loss of function. So the loss of function is that TB43 leaves the nucleus. That results in misplaced proteins, i.e. cryptic proteins. 
you also get this gain of function. The gain of function is the aggregates. And so TDB43 leaves the nucleus and TDB43, when it's not in its normal cellular state, aggregates incredibly quickly. It's also why it's a very difficult protein to work with in the lab, but it starts to form these disease associated hexamers. And that specifically is the drug target of ACE2223. So what happens in the disease state is essentially the equilibrium of the protein dynamics starts to shift. It goes over to the right into the red. So what ACE2223 does is it's highly brain permeable and highly cell permeable. So it can get into the cell cytoplasm and there it breaks up. It disrupts these disease associated hexamers that allows TDB43 to go back into its functional form, which allows it to go into the nucleus. Barry want to specifically call this out because ACE2223 does not clear TDB43. TDB43 is a vital RNA binding protein. You don't want to clear it from the system. We're just letting TDB43 go back into its normal function and do its job in the motor neurons. So specifically, ACE2223 does destabilize that TDB43 hexamer. As I mentioned earlier, this is a challenging drug target. There's no crystal structure. So over the past year, we have taken efforts to do de novo physics-based simulations to further confirm that direct physical engagement between ACE2223 and the hexamer. So what I'm just showing you here is an image of that. This is an one ACE2223 small molecule in the white engaging the center core of a malfunctioning TDB43 cylindrical hexameric aggregate. Now, we have also validated this specific engagement with actual biophysical assays. We take a lot of pride in this because, once again, it's also a difficult protein to work in the lab, but this is the only way you can really verify that your true drug, drug target is that misfolded TDB43. So on the left-hand side, we have an assay using IM mobility mass spectrometry. This is a highly specialized mass spec assay, and what's nice is that you can very specifically measure these size ranges, so we can measure that hexamer as it's formed. This is with recombinant TDB43 in a cell-free environment. And then when we add ACE2223, you can see that that hexamer peak completely dissolves. And equally importantly, you see that functional monomer and dimer levels increase on that right-hand side. On the right-hand side of the slide, you'll also see that we have done atomic force microscopy studies. Let, let's just look at high resolution at ALS patient-derived TDB43 aggregates. This means we did actually post-mortem extract TDB43 from a sporadic ALS patient brain, and that TDB43 does aggregate extremely quickly when you seed it with recombinant TDB43. And that's what you see on this left hand uh, atomic force microscopy picture. And you can see in the size range on the bottom that you're getting a bit of a larger size range. But when you dose with ACE2223 on the final slide on the right, on the final figure on the right, you can see that that size range is decreased. And so we're pushing it back into the correct diameter for functional monomers and dimers. Um, so this also gives us confidence that the the compound actually works on a human relevant form of TDP43. ASLA's proprietary uh, platform identifies unique chemotypes that target both the gain and loss of function of TDP43. So if, if you see our logo in the upper right-hand corner in any of these slides, that does mean it's an in-house assay. We take a lot of pride in rigorous in-house assays, making sure that they're very repeatable. We have both gain of function and loss of function assays, and ACE2223 acts on all of these, uh, uh, all of these assays in a very potent manner. So on the cell-based side, ACE2223 does restore TDB43 gain and loss of function mechanisms. We have assays both for the removal of misfolded cytoplasmic TDB43 and the restoration of nuclear TDB43. Uh, just very quickly on the right, essentially what you're seeing in the top green figure is that, that toxic TDB43 that is aggregated in the cytoplasm. So it's the tiny dots. The bright large green is a nucleus. You want to maintain that. So when you treat with ACE2223, you just see the dots in the cytoplasm go away. That means that you're, you're resolving that gain of function issue. And then on the left hand, I'm sorry, on the right hand side, you can see that in the nucleus here, when we're looking at just nuclear TDB43, it's a bit of a grayer tone. That's representing the TDB43 loss out of the nucleus. And when you treat with ACE2223, you see the nucleus get brighter. So that means that ACE2223 is allowing TDB43 to go back into the nucleus. ACE223 also rescues neuronal toxicity. This is in an iPSC-derived TB43 ALS patient motor neuron. 
Um, and you can see that in the motor neuron, it has a rate of death about twice that of a healthy iPSC. And when you dose with a single 300 nanomolar dose of ACE2223 and then observe the cells over 10 days, there's a 35% delay in neuronal death. We've also run several other functional assays, including downstream misplicing. So here we're showing that when you dose with H2223, you get a nice dose-dependent decrease um, in cryptic exons, meaning we are restoring that functional misplicing. Additionally, ACE223 also rescues synaptic activity. So this is a TDB43 oligomer-induced mouse hippocampal slice. What we're really showing here is that these TDB43 oligomers do indeed affect neuronal firing. So they decrease plasticity. So what you're seeing is you're trying to restore that, that non-disease vehicle state. Um, and because the dark purple is that disease state in the short-term and long-term plasticity where you see that the, the synaptic firing is decreased. So when we add back ACE2223 in the light purple, you do see a restoration of that synaptic firing. We've also run two animal models. So ACE2223 demonstrates brain PK, target engagement, and efficacy in the ITDB43A315T model. This is daily oral dosing for eight weeks after pathology was present in the brain. That's when we started dosing. Just want to call out the target engagement. So in terms of phosphorylated TDB43, we see a nice decrease in phosphorylated TDB43 from the dark purple disease model. We're actively looking at that as a potential biomarker in the clinic. We also see a nice decrease in neural inflammation as measured by GFAP. I'm also really excited to share with you a second animal model we're running today because this is based off of feedback from our last ALS1 conference because we got a lot of questions last year about whether this compound extends survival and decreases NFL. So we went back and in this past year, we ran a second animal model in the Delta NLS mouse model. And we're really excited to report that we are seeing a significant increase in survival the dark purple is the non-treated disease animals, and the light purple are two different dose levels of our drug. And you can see that we're significantly extending survival. We are also significantly decreasing NFL. This is NFL decreased just at four weeks, but we're encouraged by this trend. In the Tofersen studies, which of course is SOD1 ALS, we understand that's a different type of ALS, but still in those Tofersen studies, around 28 weeks, you see about a 50 to 60% decrease in NFL. So we're encouraged that at four weeks, we're seeing about a 15% decrease in a really aggressive animal model. You know, it's putting us on track and giving us encouragement that there is clinical translatability to our results. And to our knowledge, ACE2223 is also the first small molecule to show significant survival rescue in this specific animal model. So I just want to take a step back. We've shown you a lot of data. Most importantly, I just want to call out that ACE223 not only hits the specific hexamer, but we're also seeing a lot of functional improvements like restoring splicing, restoring nuclear loss. Um, we're also seeing an increase in survival and a decrease in NFL. So what comes next? Of course, we're thinking about clinical trials. We're already gearing up for that. And we have a clear biomarker and clinical trial strategy. In terms of biomarkers, we know that's on everyone's mind. This is a difficult drug target. It's also difficult for biomarkers. Um, we did show you data that we're moving STM in two. We're moving phosphorylated TB43. We're exploring all those as potential biomarkers and target engagement. We're also looking in, for efficacy biomarkers in terms of NFL and GFAP. And we do plan to conduct a phase 1A in healthy patients as, as a start. In terms of those timelines to the clinic, we have already completed a type C meeting with the FDA to make sure that they're, they're comfortable with the compound. And we have an amazing ADME profile, so there's, there's no issues there. It's, it's highly soluble, highly brain penetrant. We're slated for an IND submission middle of next year. As I mentioned, we're, we're quite literally right now starting, we're running our rat and dog dose range finding studies at Charles River. And so we're estimating that late next year, we would start that healthy volunteer dosing. And then in late 2026, we'd start dosing in ALS patients. And we're working as fast as we can that up as much as we can in a safe manner. Um, and I just want to conclude that the entire ACELAT team is really encouraged by all of the preclinical data we have. We think the functional effects could lead to a real translation in the clinic. Um, and it's an incredible honor for us to continue carrying forward the compound. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Katie. That was fantastic presentation, kind of a tour de force of data. Really appreciate it. Um, we have one question from the chat so far. Um, there's a yeah. question regarding 
Um, optimal cell models to demonstrate TDP43 cytoplasmic aggregation and or nuclear loss of function. What have you found has been really effective for that uh, uh, objective? Yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, and, you know, we have to use a portfolio of models. So in terms of the most reproducible, you say me, people may still argue it's a little bit artificial, but the sodium arsenide is by far the most reproducible in our hands. So we do use those for screening assays day in and day out. Um, what we also explore and are continuing to explore in-house is varying levels of stress and different types of stress in iPSCs. For example, right now, sometimes instead of directly measuring aggregates, that's very actually hard in terms of a resolution problem, we're measuring proxy outputs such as, such as NFL. That what mass spec data I showed up front is really wonderful. It's high resolution. You can't do that in a cell right? The, the, these hexamers are too small. So you, you do have to use a portfolio of, of assays to make sure that you're seeing a genuine effect. Thank you. A um, couple other questions from the chat. So one is, you show a nice reduction, cryptic splicing of several TDP43 uh, client RNAs. Um, do you know if the subsequent normal splicing goes back up to account for effects that ACE2223 uh, might have on transcription. Yeah. So it depends a little bit on the cellular model. We've run this both in iPSCs and that data I showed you is SHSY. We see similar trends. I will say, I believe in the SHSY, we don't necessarily see an increase in the, the total protein levels. Um, but I can have our preclinical director, Dr. Vidim Matur, follow up online because we have run this in multiple models um, and the, the results can be a little bit different, right? In an immortalized cell line versus an iPSC. Fantastic. And then um, one more from the chat. Um, have you settled on what would be a target engagement marker for the compound? Yes. So we are actively looking at multiple because we understand that as we develop it, there's there's no guarantee of success because we're we're going where some people haven't gone before. Um, so we are actively considering phosphorylated TB43, um, even considering looking at maybe de novo antibody campaigns. We know there's some issues um, with specificity there. Uh, we do have a really strong in-house team on protein aggregation assays. So we are also actually looking at a TB43 seeding assay that would be analogous to the Michael J. Fox alpha synuclein seeding assay. Um, full disclosure, you know, these are all new assays that we're working on. So I, I, we can't guarantee which one it will be, but, but those are ones we're actively considering and exploring internally and with partners. We have time for a couple more. Um, so did you measure cryptic exons in the in vivo models? Great question. So the cryptic exons, are not the same proteins in an animal model as in humans. Um, so we we have retrospectively looked and observed uh, in, in a separate post-mortem um, animal study that you can see some cryptic exons in these animals, but they're not at all STMN2 and UNC13A. So for translatability, you can't you can't really make any any kind of causal inferences there. That's not specific to our animal models. It's it's just you know, for, for, for any of these ALS animal models, unfortunately. And I think we have time for one more. Um, there's a question about, and it kind of relates to um, articulating this as a sporadic ALS uh, drug. Um, it um, You showed data in iPSC-derived motor neurons from yeah. TP mutant lines. Um, did you look in other lines, other cell lines? Yeah, so it's a great point. And, you know, Broadly, our, our plan is, is sporadic ALS, but that's part of our clinical trial plans is we are very interested in potentially enrolling ALS patients um, in the early stages with, with TB43 mutations, because especially in a phase 1B or phase 2, that's the best time to understand if we could have an effect on those patients. Because as you noted, the iPSC was M337, um, but the A315T, that's another mutant that is found in patients. So we do have data that it is effective. Uh, I think the best strategy is probably to be enrolling patients in sporadic ALS, but also including in those early trials, patients with a mutated form um, so that we can get the benefit of a broader patient selection. We can move trials faster, but we can we can subset after that phase one, B and two and, and understand if we should be carrying forward um, and, and enrolling TDB43 patients with, patients with T, mutant TDB43 in a phase three also. 
Well, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and for taking the time to answer those questions.